maybe it's okay to sometimes spend a little bit more on a nicer build. This summer, I've been test driving the Surface Laptop Go 2. It's basically replaced our Pixelbook Go in this house as the living room web browser computer. And I've been writing most of my scripts on it over the last couple months. To spoil some of the conclusion of this video, there's a fine line between inexpensive and cheap. And Microsoft has made a few build quality choices to stay on the nicer side of inexpensive. This machine is one of the most portable laptops you can own, is reasonably powerful, and with the middle spec options arrives as a price competitive solution. Even just comparing in the Surface lineup, the Go 2 is improved over the Go 1, where the base model of this new laptop is more expensive than the previous generation, but comes with a more usable tier of storage. I think the middle option, Go 2, is likely the sweet spot, and the most expensive gets a little more more storage to play with. We gotta make sure we're keeping these products focused on the right target demographic, the audience that this thing was built for. More and more of our work and data is living online using web services and browsers. So the Laptop Go is built to compete against nicer Chromebooks. Immediately, this frame, this build is really nice. It's really nice. I've used a number of smaller laptops and ultrabooks and convertibles. The Go 2 has been one of the most portable. It's easy to hold and carry. It's silly, but this does make a lot of those 13-inch laptops just feel bigger, feel more cumbersome. So I've seen a few criticisms about the price, and considering the storage, RAM, and the processing, the full MSRP is priced a little higher in this class of laptop. I get it. It's tough to get a feel for this stuff when you're just watching videos, if you don't have easy access to a big box store, and even when you are next to a Best Buy, you might not always have good display models to play with. Some of the solutions in this tier of laptop are going to be really plasticky. You get a creaky or flexy case when you pick it up, a wobbly hinge when you lift the display. It's totally fair to shop a system where you might get more RAM or storage. Maybe you're okay compromising on a larger portable computer, or a creakier and plasticky case. The Go 2 is a different kind of balance. It's inexpensive, but it feels a lot nicer than the price tag. The lifestyle hardware built in fits that idea too. The keyboard has a great tactile feel, good key travel, nice chunky key action, and with a quiet typing behavior. Very nice if you have to share a dorm room, you shouldn't use my clacky gaming keyboard if you have a roommate. And making this design a little nicer still, the speakers deserve a lot of praise. This is an ultra portable, and we're not gonna throw speakers to the sides of the keyboard. We're not gonna take that extra space laterally. Often on laptops in this class, the solution is to bounce the audio down through the bottom of the laptop and reflect it off your desk, which can work well, but it's not great when your notebook is in your lap. The Go 2 hides the speakers under the keyboard and this works surprisingly well. Sound is almost as good as options with up firing speakers that are pointing at your face and the keyboard panel is still phenomenally rigid. There's not really any case flex when you're typing down hard. I nerded out on this a little bit. Neither audio nor typing is compromised in this configuration, and that's not easy to pull off. Ditto the headphone jack. Audio performance here punches above the price tier. Often on other more student grade laptops, headphone audio is a compromise for a lower cost. The Go 2 is not gaming laptop good, but it's better than most slim notebooks around $1,000. It's definitely outpacing my Pixelbook Go. So there are some other trade-offs, you know, like the screen is not the highest resolution, but it is a full touch panel and the panel quality is nicer than I was expecting it to be at this price. Like it's benchmarking well. When I test other monitors and I look at things like color and contrast and the backlight uniformity, again, better than we usually see on sub $1,000 gear. I put it up against a portable OLED and I had to crank my camera ISO to see the differences in contrast. That's pretty nice. Movies, gaming, and videos 
they look real good. For the respectively thin bezels around the screen, there is actually a, a pretty decent 720p webcam kind of tucked away up there above the screen. It's a fine camera for 720p, but if you can give this any additional light, it really does help spruce up the image. We just shouldn't expect that everyone can somehow pack studio grade lighting into their dorm rooms. My main complaints with the Go 2 are some of the more obvious compromises. I do wish the backlight could get a little brighter. It's great indoors, but if you wanna take your work outside, we could always do with a little more juice. And at night, I'm not a bad touch typer, but a backlit keyboard, that would be nice too. What I really like about this laptop, especially at the mid-tier price, it's easy to flesh this out with some good accessories and stay at a lower overall budget. Microsoft sent along the Ocean Plastic Mouse and the really nice travel Bluetooth keyboard. Really good, really inexpensive ways to make this a bit more ergonomic on a student desk. You can take this tiny little laptop to class, and then when you bring it back home, you can prop it up taller and link it to a wireless keyboard and mouse. But with the ports on the laptop, I'd highly recommend a good laptop hub or a proper dock. You can easily go dual or triple display plugging in one USB-C cable. And I do like that we have USB-C and USB-A. Still plenty of accessories that use the old rectangular USB port. But I was also really happy that the USB-C properly supported video out and charging. Now, Microsoft has a proprietary click-in charger on the opposite side. I actually thought it was a, a memory card reader when I first got the laptop and I was incorrect, but I really haven't used this proprietary charger at all. I have got some really good power delivery phone chargers and I use a multi-monitor dock. I plug in one cable, I can get dual display and charge the laptop. Some extra ports to hook up other accessories or add a direct cabled ethernet connection. It does not cost a lot to really flesh out this machine and make it more of a computer. Because the processing power is respectable. We're keeping our target audience in mind. Low costs for a capable compute platform and living in a number of web and cloud services for school, work, or play. I thought it was really cute that the Microsoft PR folks they were really trying to explain, well, we've got Office and Microsoft 365, and, and I do. I write most of my scripts in Word, and I keep a couple of my benchmarking charts in Excel. For talking to tech reviewers as long as they had been, those Microsoft PR reps seemed very relieved to have someone know what Microsoft services were out there. But I digress. I've been holding onto my scripts since I started reviewing gadgets. None of those docs live on any of my computers. They're all up in the cloud on the OneDrive. So a Core i5 with eight gigs of RAM, no one is going to claim that this is a screamer content creation machine playing AAA games in 4K at 60 frames per second. That's not what this thing is. But doing a little low level 1080p video editing, you've got enough horsepower for that. You shoot a couple clips on your phone, you just wanna stitch them together. This machine is totally capable. It's not gonna render fast, but you can totally do it. And we're in pretty good shape for some photo and image editing. I like GIMP, and you're not going to hit this with tons of layers and super high resolution projects, but plenty of machine to cobble together a decent YouTube thumbnail. Can confirm, my YouTube thumbnails are hot garbage. And I gotta give them some kudos. Microsoft PR was also smart to highlight services like Game Pass and xCloud. Game streaming is definitely more this laptop speed. You can kind of play through games like Tetris Connect, but if you're on decent data, game streaming is the great equalizer. Nothing holding you back from a decent console grade experience even on a less expensive product. The performance is good. There's nothing here that's really letting me down, but in this class and with a focus on web services, we definitely need the battery life. And this always gets twitchy. You know, how you use your compute products is gonna be very different than how I use mine. So Microsoft rates this for 13 hours of runtime. The breakdown on Microsoft's testing sounds about right. It's a mix of browser use with multiple tabs open, some office apps, and the screen set to around medium brightness. Kind of makes sense. I mean, if you crank up the display, the brightness is gonna drain the battery faster. And this is a Core i5. So if you run it hard, you get it really running warm, and you get the fan spinning up, 
that's also going to drain your battery faster. I found that it's very good for mixed all day use. Pop it open, do a little writing, close it, pop it open, reply to an email, watch a YouTube video, close it. It's really good at hanging with you through a whole day of that kind of mixed browser and web kind of use. And the fan curve is pretty nice. It stays near silent for a good chunk of use. Even spinning up to full speed, it's not that loud. Okay, so this is Microsoft hardware, obviously running Microsoft software. I've been enjoying Windows 11 through these recent updates, and it's been interesting to watch the company's transition. It's extremely difficult managing traditional computer UI and introducing touch elements. So there's definitely still some polish that needs to happen with some of the UI. There are still older menus that will pop up that are like Windows XP era design elements. But that situation has been improving and we've seen some on the Windows team are really taking that uniformity into consideration. Every major update has addressed some of those usability concerns. Microsoft has the most to lose in displacing legacy users while trying to bring Windows more up to the modern era. Google's Chrome OS is more streamlined and doesn't have to support nearly as many older computers. Apple won't even try to add touchscreens to Macs. So when we look at Windows 11, I think they're actually balancing this pretty well, but this is a work in progress because it can't be an immediate and stark transition. So many techies flipped out about Windows 8 trying to push us too far too fast. We're getting our first glimpses of a new direction where we still have support for legacy software, but we're also a lot more current on apps and web services. I'm shocked. The Microsoft Store is actually usable for the first time in my gadget reviewing career. And we're getting support for Android apps. If you've been playing around with the Amazon App Store, something tells me this landscape is going to be morphing quickly over the next couple years. Microsoft getting more developers on board in a way that previous versions of Windows, Windows X, Windows Mobile, Windows RT, they could never get them building discrete mobile style applications for Microsoft boxes. It didn't happen as quickly as I would have wanted it to, but that is progress. So that's where we can start wrapping this whole video up. Circling back to the top, I think this is a unique machine. It's one of the slimmest, one of the lightest, and one of the most portable that still delivers a goodly amount of compute power. Beyond that, I feel it's fair to say there is a little bit of a surface tax for a nicely built machine. It's not like a number of those other lower cost laptops and Chromebooks. It's not just thin and plasticky. This feels like it's built for students or built for travel. Understanding the lifestyle durability of a kid chucking this into a backpack, and it's probably one of the best fit computers for a modern airplane tray table. I think that's a special combination. It's inexpensive, but it's not cheap. So I will, of course, leave some links down below where you can find more information on the Surface Laptop Go 2 just in time for a little back to school shopping or maybe back to the office and you need something that's not gonna weigh you down on your work backpack. The times, they are a changing. I don't know where that came from. As always, thanks so much for watching, for sharing these videos, subscribing to the channel. All the support lately has been amazing. Those of you who are clicking the links in the description if you're hitting my home site, somegadgetguy.com, if you're shopping some merch, or if you're joining the list of names scrolling by on your screen from my Patreon, patreon.com slash somegadgetguy. This list is basically the coolest collection of tech pals in the universe. True story. So I hope you'll check them out. Now, you know where you can find me around the rest of the internet, at somegadgetguy on the Twitters and the Twitch, not so much on the Facebooks and the Instagrams, and I will catch you all on the next review.